Vegas. This is NAB Show. Vegas. This is NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast B. Hello and welcome to the 2017 NAB Show, broadcasting live from Las Vegas. I'm trying to get my voice uh, going here. Sounds got... very sexy, Ryan. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, uh, that's how I roll. So, all right. I'm Ryan Salazar. We have Brian Seth Hurst and the amazing Jeanette DePatty. Great. How are you guys doing? Hi, We're doing great. great. We're excited about the show, getting started, and it's great to be back. It is great it to is. be back, and it, it's it's actually it's very exciting to go and walk the floor and watch old friends come back, but every yes. once in a while you see a pocket of somebody new and there's so much activity in the AR VR pavilion now and you can feel over there, you can feel the industry start to mature. Yes. And so it's great. You can always tell what's going on when they're, but Jeanette and I have been doing this for God's yeah. years. And so, I mean, we, we've walked the floor a lot together when things are being constructed and it's just actually, it's great to do that and you can kind of feel what's going to happen this year and it, it's good. I think that we're, you know, there are years where there's it's it's a little leap and then there are years where they're a quantum leap and now we're at 8k and we're vr cameras that are actually shooting at 12k oh, it's and, amazing and a thousand frames per second and you're going wow this is this could be a quantum leap <laughs> yeah i'm a total kid in a candy store here and there's so much technology that i don't understand but you you obviously you have Jeanette to, can explain yeah, every, <laughs> it's, yeah so Jeanette is the knower of all information oh, so, no 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 don't set me up for that oh my goodness right. i can't well so well so talk about what you're doing at the show so I am trend casting at the show. I'm here uh, also with Storytech, and we are looking at the trends on the show floor, and we're doing corporate briefings, and we're also going to be out on the floor uh, looking at new technology and, and figuring out what's real and what is PR puffery. Right. Because I love technology, but I am also a skeptic. So I'm, I lived in Missouri for a while, which is the show me state. So <laughs> exactly. I, I want to see it work. <laughs> All right. So the, so the ad pavilion, I guess it involves like uh, programmatic type stuff, analytics. Yes. Uh, it's, the, it's all about big data because right. it's really not about ratings anymore. It's about what data can you get on that consumer? How can you target the marketing as well as the programming specifically for that person? And how can you follow them everywhere? So if they're watching TV and they're like, oh, it's a commercial and they look on their cell phone, you want to hit them on the cell phone with the same commercial. You cannot escape. Exactly. That's what big data is all about. All right. So I'm like sandwiched in between two great people here because <laughs> Brian is involved with NAB Show as well. So let's talk about what right, you're doing. Right. So Storytech Immersive is actually a sister company to Storytech. Uh -huh. And Storytech Immersive is all about about AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. What Storytech Immersive is doing at the show, aside from what we're doing at NAB Show Live, which is all the panels that have to do with AR and VR, mm -hmm. is a complete program in the North Hall called the in the AR VR Pavilion on the VR stage. Did I get all that right now? <laughs> on the VR stage. Uh, this is called the AR VR Content Sessions. Okay. And the difference between that program and a lot of other things is these are the people that are actually involved day to day, hands rolled up, sleeves rolled up, hands deep in, in actually making VR because there's a lot of hype about VR. There's a lot of people talking about there's VR. There's plenty of people making noise about VR. Yes, that's right. There's uh, way more of those than that's people That's right. We're not talking VR. immersive audio noise. We're <laughs> but what's interesting, though, is AR VR, it stuck. Like, I mean, well, so last year it started really getting chatted about a uh -huh, lot at the show. Uh -huh. And you know everybody wonders is it gonna is it gonna throw go off the wayside the next show around? And it's not the case. It doesn't appear to be that way. It's it's, it's no, certainly because becoming it's mainstream. So many verticals. It's not just entertainment. It's medicine. It's education. It's architecture. It's engineering. It's even uh, therapy, medical therapy. There for for quadriplegics and people suffering from post traumatic stress syndrome. Well, and, and I think too with AR, which is is likely to surpass VR eventually. This is going to be the new interface Interface, the new human interface with data and technology. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to use gestures and we're going to be able to see our data in front of us in a new way. And I think when you think of it in those terms, you see how big this really can be, like super big. Awesome. Godzilla big. <laughs> so uh, my favorite part of, of NAB show, because I come from the post 
you know, the post world, post production world, really. So the, is is post production world and South Hall. I love South Hall because it's 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 all about about post. There's a lot of uh, storage solutions, workflow, media asset management, um, uh, software. There's Adobe and Maxon and, yep. and all those guys. Yep. Um, that's that's where that's where, where where my life is is it over there. But I'm, I want to learn a lot about AR and VR. Well, you know, the thing is, is that post production in VR yeah. is like you're getting all these new plugins. Um, it used to be that we had to make stuff up. It used to be that we literally had to hack solutions together, and to some extent, we still do. But now you have you have Metal as a plugin for Adobe Premiere, and sure. you have um, 360 Rise now coming out with a whole 360 editing solution. Actually, Michael will be on the wow. show and talk a little bit about oh, that's that. Great. So um, it's been an adventure, but now. Being able to post in 360, meaning you can actually be in the headset and post, that's what's coming, and that's much easier for filmmakers. That's amazing. So, so oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and when you have like information overload, like you cannot deal with any more technical data, then you can just go to the aerial pavilion and, and fly a drone around. That's always like a little relaxing. They have a net there, so you can't break anything or have to you know whip out your credit card. So that's good. But it's really fun to just fly these things around. And you know, drones have really come a long way now. They're, uh, they have AI integrated into them. And crash protection. Crash protection. Wow. Crash avoidance. But you can also like set your flight path. In fact, tonight, you can take a, a session where you can learn to drive your drone at night. <laughs> I was just like, well, that sounds cool. <laughs> it's like awesome. four o'clock when you're actually awake and you could be out there, you know, with well, a beer know, driving a drone. I was with Andrew Hancock and he has a drone and he's very, very good at, at drone. Yeah, so sure we is. were on this beach and the drone is gone. It's up in the clouds and it's photographing the sun up in the clouds. Like when you, wow. when you wait in a plane, right? Uh -huh. And I'm like, I'm... I didn't pay for it, so it doesn't matter to me where it goes. <laughs> but I'm like, where is this thing going, and how do you know where it is? And right. he's like, no, it always comes back to you. It's like, it's like a boomerang. It's like a, a carrier pigeon. And, and they have electronic. following capabilities now too, so you can set up sort of the magic sensor in your car, and you can drive down the street, and the drone will just follow you like up to 35 miles an hour. Okay, this which is getting in, scary. I, which in exactly. Los Angeles is as fast as you ever get, <laughs> by the way. But yeah. Well, so another thing that I love about NAB show is the people that you meet. You know, um, I've met so many people here, and it's like a family reunion, including you guys. You know, every time we come here, everybody gets back together. Everybody's from all over the world, uh, and and one guy that that I ran into this morning uh, is Philip Grossman. We know each other probably for about five years now. How you doing, Phil? I'm doing great. So Philip Grossman uh, produced uh, a documentary on um, on Chernobyl, and I, I, I just. I think it's amazing. You've got Thanks. the most man hours at the Chernobyl site, so you're, that's why you're growing. You're glowing yeah, green when yeah. you're in a dark room, right? Yeah, over a hundred days there. Now. <laughs> exactly. So, so wow. he still has all his teeth. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, so go ahead and talk about it. So, it, it really started as a, a you know uh, my around my 40th birthday. So my wife uh, says it was my midlife crisis. I, I decided to leave corporate America, and I was a photographer and sort of budding cinematographer, and decided I was going to go do something. And my wife said. Focus on your photography. So I, you know, started meeting with gallery owners, and they said your work is great, but you don't have a cohesive story. And of course, my first thought was, what the heck is a cohesive story? Um, so I started, you know, I put my engineering hat on, which is my background, and started looking at other photographers and how they became well known. And one of them was, you know, shoot something that nobody has, or be the first one to do it. So. Chernobyl just sort of coming, kept coming up. It was the 40, or excuse me, it was the uh, 25th anniversary. I grew up near Three Mile Island. My family's from the Ukraine. Last stop before coming to America. So all those things sort of came together. So I managed to figure out how to get there in 2011, and uh, thought it was a one-time, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And it just I've gone back and back and started thinking about doing a documentary and you know it's taken a long time but uh, I'm happy to announce that I have an agreement with the to work with the science channel and have a uh, program this summer with them but not only are you gonna have the program but you're hosting the program uh, yeah I'm hosting the program I never <laughs> oh, thought you know that's 2011 killer. when I went there that I'd be the host <laughs> Uh, but evidently now I'm going to be the host, and I'm talking about drones, so I have the, the distinction of being the first person ever to fly a drone in the Chernobyl region in 2000 and 2011, 2012. And that's before you had the GPS where it came back to you. It was, you hope it came back, and it would, I also have the distinction of probably being the first person to crash a drone in Chernobyl. <laughs> oh dear. Wow. Well, so, I think comparatively speaking, that was a little disaster. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. So. Uh, 
I've seen behind the scenes photos and everything. It's 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 quite amazing, Brian and and and, and Jeanette. It's like just it's it's wild that you've been there so many times. Yeah, and thank you. I'm just curious it. as to the precautions that you. You have to take because you know you see some photographs it's, it looks incredibly eerie yeah and it is and it's like a restricted area right you have to pass through a bunch of stuff yes. to get into it so when i first started going it was it was very difficult to gain access and it and it took time and energy and effort to deal with the right government officials to gain access uh over the years and with the 20 or excuse me the 30th anniversary last year it's sort of become a budding tourism business now in the ukraine wow. um, which is is odd with just bus tours and people going but because of the the, the amount of time and energy that I've spent in, in building these relationships, I've actually been able to get inside of control room number four oh when the accident gosh. happened. Did uh, you have to wear any protective clothing? And yeah, so you wear you wear a, a, a heavy cotton wool suit and respirator and a dosimeter and everything is, is sort of measured. But the, the funny thing is, in the village of Chernobyl, which is about eight miles from the reactor, the radiation levels are about the same as they are here. So that's where the tourism. Wow. I'm sorry about that. That's yeah. where the tourism is in the village. Well, they go to the village. That's where you stay because it's still within the zone. It's, it, one of the interesting facts is that what they call the zone of exclusion or zone of alienation. Most people don't realize it's the size of the state of Rhode Island. Wow. No one officially lives there. Although there, are, there were at one time were several hundred. It's now down to a handful of, of resettlers that still live there. And I've met them and spoken with them and interviewed them. Um, one of them that you know, Grandpa Sava and his wife Elena. He just passed away at age 80. He moved back 10 days after the accident. So radiation is one of those things that's really sort of a misunderstood. I, I've been to Fukushima as well because everybody goes, do you go to Fukushima? And I went to Fukushima and I took my dosimeter and I measured from the time I left to the time I landed. I actually received more radiation on the airplane ride there and back than I did spending 10 days on the ground in Fukushima. Huh. So people so, who fly a lot, like myself, you actually get <laughs> a lot higher radiation exposure in the airplane than you do uh, in some place like Chernobyl. So in, in the in the show that you're doing, mm -hmm. are you dispelling a lot of the myths that that are around this now? So and we're going to explore those. I don't want to get into too many details, but we're going to look at you know what happened, the the, the sort of the, the the mythology around what happened, what actually happened, and uh, it's, I've learned a lot. It's 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 been I'm, I'm a scientist, engineer by training, and and uh, so for me, it's, 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 just, it's been a complete learning experience. I think that's why I dove into it so much, because I did not know anything about it. You know what's interesting is that, that there is a fascination with, I mean, we're talking about broadcasting, and we're talking about storytelling. There is a fascination with sure. disaster. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. Just this thing that yeah. wraps you. We're working in a specific thing right now that's a, a disaster took place in the early 1900s and the globe is still people around the world yeah. are still fascinated and yeah. the more you talk is like the more you want to ask him questions yeah, yeah. The, the, can't wait for the show yeah, yeah the, the pictures when you see them it's it's like almost like you went into a hotel right yeah. and everybody disappeared yep but everything's still left in place yep they and literally up and left they had three hours to evacuate 50,000 people from the city of Pripyat, and wow. the stuff is remaining there. In fact, there are cigarette butts still on the tables, the floors. Oh, wow. the, the, I know when one family left from one of the villages, because it says May 3rd, the last calendar date that was on the tear-off calendar. So, but for me, it's also it's been combining my passion of cinematography with my, my day job in the broadcast world. So it's sure. really kind of been a, an interesting uh, journey. Wow. And I think that's one of the beautiful things. You know, you were talking about the people that you meet here at the NAB. And I think one of the beautiful things is that as broadcasters, we bring the world to the rest of the world. We sure. bring these experiences to you that you couldn't have any other way. And I think that's part of what makes us a family of, of broadcasters. Even it, now, it we're small, streaming. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so many booths are streaming from the floor. Exactly. It's, it's, it's amazing. Deal. It's it's a bandwidth war out there. Though. I mean, exactly. You have to you have to beg for every bit uh, because there's so much streaming going on that it, it, the amount of data that is flowing in and out of this place right now is astronomical. So so Brian, so of course you're involved with the AR and VR pavilion. Uh, is there anything really special to you? on the floor like in South or Central or North? Well, other than but that? first of all, to watch the maturity of some of the companies, what's come up. Oh, sure. And so, and they're all, 
the way everything is positioned, lenses are there, post-production software is there. Even though John, I think John is in Central Hall, mm -hmm. but Ozo is over there. And there's such a rich program that the very things that will be talked about on stage, the, the, the people who are attending will just be able to walk right to the booth and ask any more questions that they have. So there are a couple of young startups that are there, mm -hmm. but you can watch a couple of the maturities. So you've got cameras, you've got the new Yi camera mm -hmm. that is actually uh, competing with GoPro. Wow. And, um, um, and has a partnership with 360 Rise now. And then you've got, um, and Tanya Lenses is on the floor. They were not here before. Oh, one other thing I just thought of is Facebook Live is actually it's here at NAB. They have a pavilion. I know. I really want their marketing budget because it must be like <laughs> epic. Like Google's even here too. I, I know. It's really exciting. And if you really want to see like what's up and coming, uh -huh. I strongly recommend you head, head over to the Sprocket oh, area. Yes. Yeah. That's where there you know there's these tiny little booths from these, you know, startup companies and every single person you talk to is a genius. Like every single one, right. you can spend like your head will be like pounding after because there's so much Im impressive data. Yes, that you can Sprocket's get. an amazing program. We're good friends with with Harry Glazier, uh -huh. uh, the founder of Sprocket, and uh, it's so cool to see startups because it's it's a small idea that somebody had, and then they come here. And then some large company comes and possibly makes a deal with them on the show it floor. It does happen. Which I've seen happen. Last year, a multi-million dollar deal happened. I, I can't say who it was, but like that happens here. It's amazing. It's so cool. It's like Shark Tank, but like right here, you know? You know, and I think that people have the idea that it's all big companies now yeah. and there's no opportunity. But there still is opportunity in the broadcast market for those small, brilliant guys. They find a need, they meet the need, and... By God, they're acquired by somebody huge, and then they get a really fancy car. That's what happens. All right, all right, so, <laughs> so, but the car is connected, yeah. and you actually stream live from oh, the car. And the Ford, exactly. the Ford, they're having a competition for the connected car in oh, the that's Ford awesome. booth. It's so cool. That's great. Um, so, so what, what other than what you're involved in and what Brian's involved in, is there something special on the show floor for you? Well, I mean, this connected car thing is pretty cool. So okay. there's all of these different companies competing to create content around this connected Ford car. And I think that's also part of the autonomous vehicle thing. So I think that's really neat. And then, of course, just the connected pavilion, the IP connected pavilion, and seeing how things talk to each other. I mean, it's always a team effort in broadcasting and in technology and with people. So. Yep. All right, cool. Well, uh, Philip Grossman, it, it was excellent having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> and, and I'm sure we'll catch up this week. Most definitely. I think you'll have some of my coworkers on eventually at some point in time. Oh, from yeah. Imagine. We've got so, Charlie on the show. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Cool. Um, all right. This has been another edition of uh, NAB Show Live. This is the first one on, uh, on Sunday. I, I'm so excited that we're going to have 40 hours of programming this week. It's going to be so exciting. I'm exhausted already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> i got to get my voice uh, back before tomorrow. I think I'm going to pull it off, guys. Uh, we'll see you soon here on NAB Show Live. Tammy Dobruns from Master Control at WPLG TV in South Florida. I've been here for 33 years and you are watching the NAB show live. Hi everyone, I'm meteorologist Craig Adams from CBS 6 WRGB TV in Albany, New York, the world's very first television station. You're watching NAB show live. I'm Jack Harris, a quasi-journalist with News Radio 970 WFLA, Tampa Bay. You're watching NAB Show Live. I know broadcasters will continue to find opportunity in the choices we make. Choices that allow broadcasters to continue serving the American people.
we'll see you at the 2017 NAB show. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. This is NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast Beat. Hello and welcome to NAB Show Live. I'm your host, Ryan Salazar. And today we have a really special guest. I call them all special, but you are really special, especially to New Tech. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Good all to be here. All right, so we have Steve Vinton. Uh, talk about what you, where, where you work and, and what you do. Uh, I work for uh, Penn Trafford High School, which is about 20 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. So I came a long way to be here and uh, been a television production and movie production teacher there for about seven years. Okay, so um, I'm fairly new to New Tech, a couple years. We've been using their technology. We're actually broadcasting uh, with the amazing NDI technology and the IP series stuff. Unbelievable technology. It really is. Uh, it's amazing how broadcast has evolved over the last, you know, just couple years. It's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. So. How did you get to meet New Tech? Well, when I started, uh, I was trying to build a studio basically from scratch. And uh, obviously the public school area, you know, every, every dollar counts. So I needed something that was affordable sure. and something that was easy to use for the students. You know, deer in the headlights, we didn't want to do that. So I found a TriCaster and started, um, I think it was a 350 model back then, SD. And since then, we've graduated up through a couple different models. And just recently, about two months ago, we purchased an 8000. All right, so talk about your experience as a, as a film and television producer. It's, it's been a blast. Every day, is, it's not the same thing. It's not history or, or math or anything like that. Not that there's anything wrong with those. Right. But it's so different every day that it just makes it a blast to, to be involved with. So how many students do you work with on a regular basis? Uh, 120 wow. throughout the year. Yeah, uh, six different sections of classes. We start with an intro class, and then by the time they get to a senior senior level, they're in a TV3 or a Film3 production type class where they're producing their own stuff. Great. So as far as technology goes, are the students running, learning how to connect the hardware and all that, or is it more of actually functioning and working with it, with the software and everything? A little bit of both. I mean, we're not sure. tearing down the control room and, and rebuilding it right. from scratch every year, but they know how to from start to finish with a tripod and miking somebody up and setting up a camera with you know, various different models of it. We don't get too involved in the engineering side of the networking for the TriCaster and all the different NDI inputs, Right. but they, they know enough to be dangerous for sure. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I come from an engineering background. Okay. Uh, I had my first studio, I was 12 years old in my house. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, that was audio. I thought, it was, I thought audio was my calling. Yeah. I really did. I, I ended up on the radio at one point and, uh, and produced like, radio spots and stuff, and then did audio post and, and video I absolutely love now. And this is what we do as broadcast beat for NAB Show Live. It's yeah. so exciting. And, and all right, so uh, how do you guys, you, you broadcast your television, your, your students' show every day or how we often? Do, we do a live morning announcement show. Actually, we, we uh, just competed in a, in a competition at Robert Morris University, which is just outside of Pittsburgh, and, and won best morning announcement show. So pretty <laughs> proud of that. That was a new development that just happened on Thursday. But uh, we go live every morning using a TriCaster. Uh, we have a studio with a three camera feed. Uh, we can do live weather from outside using NDI. We can do a remote from the auditorium or the science lab where something cool's going on. Uh, it's controlled chaos, but it, we have a good time every morning. All right, so, so speaking of NDI, let's yes. get into that a little bit. So I, I was configuring our control room. We had it in Fort Lauderdale, the entire setup behind us here. Okay. Um, we had it, my, my friend and I, Tim, we were setting everything up and we're configuring everything and, and I'm, I'm terminating, as, as old school in me, <laughs> I've, I'm terminating all these STI cables. And I talked to Jorge from New Tech and he's like, what are you doing, Why? Ryan? I'm, I'm like, well, I have to terminate these. I have to put these into the Blackmagic video router and do this, do that. Terminate all these cables. And Jorge's like, no, 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 you don't have to do any of that. So it turns out in the end I have I think I have four SDIs yeah. going into the system, four SDIs coming out, and then I've got an IP, like basically an IP ingest piece of hardware to basically inject our SDI cameras to go into the, 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 the network. So we're a lot of letters, making them networkable. It's amazing. <laughs> So, so what did you, how was your transition, or did you have SDI in the first place? Um, 
For the last couple years, yes, and then we were just hardwired, so they had to be close enough, and you're running cabling through conduit and up through the ceiling and sure. all that stuff. And that's the way we've operated for the last, I don't know, three or four years. The high school that I work at just went through a renovation, so we, I got lucky enough to be able to build a studio and a control room and my classroom from basically from scratch. So all that was hardwired, but at the, um, about a month after we moved into the studio, after hooking the whole rack up and everything, somebody said, hey, you should check this NDI thing out, and everything changed just like that. Now we're broadcasting from the auditorium, from uh, the boardroom, from some science classroom, you name it, and you're just plugging into the, the network. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So I'll get back into the old school stuff, yeah. right? <clears throat> so you, right away you think, okay, well, I'm on a gigabit network. Yeah. I've got you know so many devices. How the heck am I going to get this thing? It's not going to work. No. It's just not going to work. And it works. It's it works. so amazing. It really works. And, and I'm just, I'm absolutely blown away with it. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the program. Okay. So you guys just recently did a mock presidential election. Let's yes, talk about that. That was actually uh, basically jumping straight into the fire. Um, <laughs> so that was a Monday before the presidential election. Our social studies department had every student in the building go to the media center library and cast their vote. And the Thursday before, our IT department finally got my TriCaster connecting to and talking to the wireless network in our building. Everything, that's all above me. Thank you to Gil and Jason back at Penn Trafford for doing that. But we tested it on a Thursday after school, ran it through its paces a little bit on Friday, and pow, we, we were doing a live broadcast. We did about 33 minutes of live coverage using iPads in the library, an anchor back in the studio, and three or four people in the control room running the switcher and the audio. We had custom graphics and a fake Twitter account, well, a real Twitter account, but for exit polling data. And it wow. came together in two days. And that was, that was the first time we ever used NDI. Amazing. And so budgetarily wise for a school, for an educational institution, you're a public school, right? Yes. So budget's a big deal. It's a very big deal. And you know, Noob Tech makes the makes it a lot easier by by using your technology. They do. You know, you're purchasing a technology, but you're getting a lot more. You're getting a lot of bang for your buck. Absolutely. Well, with the advanced edition of the software and NDI, absolutely the bang for your buck. I couldn't imagine having to piece that together with hardware and other software. Um, <coughs> luckily, we we had won a, a grant a couple years ago, and that it, it, that afforded us the opportunity to pay for a, a TriCaster. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a TV program, anyways. And then for, it wasn't that much of an upgrade to get advanced edition, and now we can go live just like a news outlet. It's not just our building, it's anywhere in the district that's on our network. It really boggles your mind if you, if you think about it. That's wild. So you, you certainly got to have uh, students in, in your class that really shine and really stick out. We do. I do, and, yes. And uh, it's really exciting to see stuff like that. A good friend of mine, Dave Burgess from Pinecrest uh, in Fort Lauderdale, um, he's an amazing teacher and uh, loves to work with kids. You gotta, you gotta have that gift of wanting to work with kids and, and be patient and all that. But there's some kids in that class that are shooting with red. Oh wow. I mean, literally the parents have purchased them red cameras. <laughs> and, uh, and Don't have and any of that. It's, it's, it's just amazing to see some of these students really shine in, in schools. It's really exciting. And that's one reason why I have a passion for us, Broadcast Beat, to be involved with education as a whole, you know, in the industry, because it's, it's really important to, to make sure everybody's learning. Yes. Um, and, and not just in educational institutions, but online or after, you know, after school or whatever. Um, so would you say that your students will be more equipped to work in the ever-evolving broadcast industry as compared to students from other schools? I hope so, but we've got a lot of really good programs in Western Pennsylvania. Right. Um, can't speak to what they do on a daily basis, but I, I do my best to give them every opportunity to deal with the kind of stuff they'll work with when they get to college. So that first semester of their freshman year, they can kind of take off and roll their sleeves up, get involved in a leadership role, maybe get, you know, a little jump on an internship, any of that type of stuff. So that, that's the intent. That's what yeah, I try I mean, to do every day. I assume you have, you know, students being, you know, producer roles and yeah. technical director roles and uh, do somebody managing the rundown, which I guess would be the producer, right? Yeah, the uh, just our typical morning show is only five or six minutes, but there's a 14, 15 students involved with script and teleprompter and weather graphics and lower thirds. Everybody's doing kind of their own thing. And then the fun thing about it is after everybody understands what they're doing, we switch and we start all over again from zero. Wow. And it 
just keeps going. Excellent. All right, so uh, what tool or skill sets will they have in going into the real world coming from your school? Uh, well, I think from, from my program, it changes so much. Like you said, this NDI, it's so new, and it's nothing like what we were doing this time last year. So I think the skill set that they would, hopefully, that, I, that, that they take away from it is just roll with the punches, kind of read about it, don't be afraid of it, get involved with it, learn how to use it, and see how it applies to the overall bigger picture. Uh, because, you know, the basics are the basics. They're not going to change. But to tell a story, it's, that's, that's what, you know, it's king. Right. So, so how did you, what, what made you fall in love with this industry? And how did you get, how did you start doing what you're doing? Well, prior to teaching, I, I sold radio advertising for a couple oh, wow. of years. Yeah, okay. and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to go back to school. My wife's a kindergarten teacher, and uh, so I was around teachers all the time. And I said, you know what, I think I'm going to give this, sh this a shot. Um, actually, I was hired as an English teacher, and luckily was transitioned into, uh, into this role because I, I absolutely love it. Self-taught on the TriCaster, self-taught on Final Cut, trying to learn Premiere. <laughs> right. Are you guys doing anything uh, uh, at the school where you're, you're remoting from other locations, either wirelessly or anything like that? We've done a few uh, live remotes with uh, when they, they live announced what the musical was going to be this year, which is a pretty big deal at our school. Oh, so wow. we were actually in the auditorium with the whole cast and crew of the Drama Guild and the teacher oh, announced wow. it. And that was, we didn't have to run any wiring, we just used an iPad with the NDI cam app and <laughs> boom. Yeah, that was it. The so only thing we needed was, wireless? A, was uh, a mic adapter. But, but it was all wireless, right? Yep. yep. And it looked great. It did. It looked great. It sounded great. That's amazing. So you, know, you going back, you think, you think going back uh, to technology how it used to be. So, yeah. think our, so our video switcher in the other room, yeah. I've got the 8000. Um, it's got an Ethernet cable and a power cable in the back. So think about how it used to be 15, 10 years ago in broadcasting. Well, even Actually, when I started, I would have to sure. run, what, five, six, seven hundred 700 feet of cabling. Yeah, even, even today, you, at the, depending where you're at, yeah. you know, you'll have a huge snake of cables coming off the back of that switcher feeding physical video through it versus it being a touch surface that's actually controlling the video elsewhere in a digital fashion or whatever. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. So um, thank you so much for being with us. Again, thank Steve you Vinson, uh, it, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome to see what you've done with your school. The guys at New Tech um, have raved about you, uh, Scott Carroll and Gentry and, and both of those guys. Uh, it's amazing. So Steve Vinton, film and television production teacher at Penn Trafford High School. Congratulations. Everybody give him a round of applause for what he has done thank with you. that school. It's awesome. Thank you. So thank you so much. We'll be back in just a few moments on NAB Show Live. Hey, what's going on? Jamie Alexander here with Broadcast Beat, and I'm here at Gear House with my buddy Mark. How are you, Mark? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm fantastic. Really excited to be here. So as you guys can see, we're in some sort of a warehouse situation, but we're going to break it down for you. We're in front of this large mobile unit, and Mark, I want you to tell us all about what this is and why it was important for you to create this. We needed to up the ante for mm -hmm. the latest technology, which currently is 4K. Because of the complexity, the amount of sources, the amount of machinery needed to make this stuff happen, we had to go to something that was built with exactly the same materials as super yachts are made from, which is Columbus, which is a 4K truck right here needed to make this truck has a number of features in it that are um, very different to your typical truck you'll find in North America. Normally on the old trucks you crank things up with a handle and basically two guys after about 45 minutes um, get very strong arms um, doing this to both lift the truck off the ground and pop out what we call an expando which is this part of the truck. So what happens on this one is going underneath I will pull this out we have a remote control and what this remote control does is we stand off we hit a button and this truck deploys four hydraulic legs and then the whole truck lifts itself off the ground when it's happy that it's level it pops this side out here by itself and the floor folds down and this truck deploys okay this looks great so this is the recording area what makes this different and special on this mobile unit we utilize evs who are a well-known survey company um, and what they do is they are, these machines enable us to record multiple sources of 4K or HD and we're able to A, record them so the client can walk away with their own hard drives of what we recorded all day 
But more importantly, or as importantly, we also do replays here. These are typically generated at a station like this. What makes this different is that we're able to move these stations anywhere around this truck. And that is mainly thanks to a, a system we've implicated in full here called VSM. So VSM is made by a German company called Lavo. What's important about that is this truck has so many sources, video and audio coming into it. We handle 4,096 by 4,096 audio cross points and then close to a thousand video cross points a human being is in charge of all this and we kind of got to the point where honestly we're kind of asking too much of a guy <laughs> as you could imagine right so we have a brain that sits over all this called VSM that enables us once we've told the brain how many sources there are what they do where they go video and audio and if you add all that up I just told you you're looking at like 5,000 by 5,000 right. sources a guy has to tell the brain at the beginning what these sources are and once it's in and that took us quite a long time to do mm. but the beauty of it now is when we want to move any source to somewhere else and even change the way the panels are configured so if someone's used to it a certain way and they want to move either down there or down the back end of the truck where we're going after or anywhere in this truck we just press a button and all of a sudden they get the same the same layout in front of them they get the same panels and we can do that very very quickly and easily mm -hmm. and that makes people happy the truck where we're going after effectively this is a 15 person control room again because of what I said earlier on about VSM and the way that we can manipulate and move easily certain positions working positions operational positions around the truck we've kind of given people a pallet for want of a better word um, of a production pallet so they walk in and we go who do you want where we're not telling them where they go yes and that's a big big difference so this monitor wall is pretty amazing. Is this in 4K also? Yes, it is. This happens to be the only all 4K monitor wall currently mm. in North America um, that we know of. Um, we've done our research, so I think it's safe to say it. Thank you so much for spending your time showing us this remarkable creation. And Not at all. Gosh, so much more to come, right? Um, yes, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> keep them peeled, for okay. sure. Las Vegas. This is NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast B. Hello and welcome to NAB Show Live, broadcasting live from Las Vegas. I'm your host, Ryan Salazar, and we're so happy to have you here from the MET360 studio, powered by New Line. Um, we have a really great guest today, John Carafin, founder and CEO of Lightfield Lab Incorporated. How are you doing, sir? Doing great. Thanks so much for having me. So, NAB Show, what does it mean to you? This show in particular is huge for us. Uh, this is actually the official debut of our company, Lightfield Lab. Uh, last year we were here launching a holographic camera with a company called Lightro. And this year we're really focused on everything that happens after you capture the image and trying to get it into the home so you have at home a holographic television. Excellent, so how did you start doing what you do? Uh, a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, no, actually uh, I have a uh, a long academic career back in the fine arts, which is uh, kind of the complete opposite of what you would expect. But my entire professional career has been combining the science with the arts and doing things that are on that bleeding edge of science fiction. Okay, um, and let's get into a little more detail about what Lightfield Lab does. Sure. So we are a technology startup company, mm -hmm. and we are currently focused on the first prototype of a holographic display that has the potential to be brought into the home, given the price points and the data transmission, all the software, all the hardware, everything that's required to enable that entire holographic ecosystem. So right now we're in that deep process of building that technology and then being able to start showing it uh, to all of our key partners and vendors. So when you say holographic technology, um, a, 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 a buddy of mine from way back, uh, John Textor, he used to run oh. dig Digital Domain. Um, you know the name. Oh, I, I used to work for him. Oh, did I you was really? at Digital Domain. Yeah. Oh, that's in funny. Florida, I, yeah, I, yeah, I was yeah. actually I ran the, uh, one of the, the studios out there. In Florida? Yeah, in Florida, oh. yeah. Oh, I was offered to, to assist in building the facility, actually. Oh, really? Yes. So you know Ron? Oh, yeah, Ron Martin. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 
All right, we go way back then. Oh, that's All right, let's funny. go back We're to this. Yeah, exactly. Okay, sorry. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so holographic. The first thing I'm thinking of, right? Tupac. Is well, is well, I'm thinking of Michael Jackson. Sure, what, yeah. what John Texter did. So, yeah. is that the sort of thing that you're doing? No, not at all. Uh, it's actually something that that's an interesting implementation of a technique called Pepper's Ghost. Um, and what they do with that is they effectively will project a, a two-dimensional projector on a piece of glass or just a, a thin film that allows you to see through it but also project onto it. So it's like a screen. So that's technically speaking a 2D display. There's nothing really all that fancy about it, but it gives you a pretty cool illusion that you can see around it. What we're working towards, and we already have uh, most of the, uh, all the materials of physics, everything's already proved in, is a full holographic display that will display every single ray to give you a physical point in space so you're able to see it and you will look at it as if it is truly there either in front of the screen or behind the screen so this is going into the deep future of uh, display technologies this is not a trick not an illusion it is actually the convergence of rays of light so it's more of a consumer technology? Well, we're starting off using uh, the implementation technique of going into the developer kits. You know, you think of like what Oculus did okay. to make sure that our key partners, everybody that would be leveraging technology, gets to start working with it, figure out how to integrate. The ultimate goal is to go into the consumer market, but we'll start off more in the industrial and then go through that process into the consumer marketplace. It, isn't it so exciting? And, and you're right in the middle of it. How everything's evolved so quickly over the last three to five years, and, and, and in this space too, especially virtual reality, augmented reality, yeah, yeah. and whatnot, and, and it's, just, it's just so exciting. So how do you, so I see here, there's a note on here, holographic display, content creation, and delivery. So yes. how are you delivering it? So that's a great question. It's something that we have as one of our key focus areas for the company because when you think about any holographic data set, just to take it a step higher, it's a massive amount of information. Okay. So what we're doing is creating a format. We're working with key partners on the content creation side in order to make that into a data stream that fits within a traditional commercial data bandwidth line, so over the internet. And that's something that takes a lot of innovation, a lot of work with real-time hardware processors on the encoding, decoding side. So that will give you the capability of having the content created either at the studios or at whoever is the, uh, the developer of the media and then be able to get it to the home without having some massive amount of back-end hardware. So are you working with content creators as well? That, that's correct. So we yeah. are working with uh, a number of key partners right now. We're in the main process of focusing on getting the hardware up and running, but we already have many of those conversations started because we've done so much work with the studios. Obviously, I was doing visual effects and right. working with the studios in uh, my past life, if you will. So, so it would involve conversations with companies like Digital Domain or Sony Pictures and, or Entertainment or whatever? That's absolutely right. right. That's okay. correct. That's there's excellent. A, yeah, there's a huge amount of interest particularly as you look at the, uh, the, the live venue space. So think about theme parks, think about uh, uh, going to the movie theater, going to anything uh, where you have a live performance. Um, having the ability to transport an entire group of people into another world is something that we keep getting a lot of interest in and scaling the display to be the size of an entire cinema wall or the size of an entire room is something that we are focused on implementing in that first uh, to second generation. All right, so I have another note here. It says, you know, what are the trade-offs between complexity, image quality, data storage processing requirements, and light field display considerations? Wow, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> uh, so there is a trade-off between what is the image quality that you see, and that's the same thing for a traditional 2D display, um, where you have the trade-off of how pure, how raw is that data versus what is it that you compress it into to see it. So think of it like when you have your DSLR. You take your image, you can get a raw file and then you can also get the compressed JPEG and you already see there is a trade-off but how significant is it will you ever see it on your display that's the same type of consideration you get for holographic media where you need to understand what is the amount of angular resolution what is the sampling density and how much can you compress that to get it into the home but still have a massively compelling experience and those are all the trade-offs that go into that format into the ability to stream over the internet to the end user Okay, so if somebody's interested in your technology, how do they find out about you? How do they look you up? Do you have a website? Uh, we do. It's lightfieldlab.com, uh, singular lab. Uh, and uh, we're more than happy to chat with anybody. If you have interest in what we're doing, we'd love to uh, have a conversation. 
All right, excellent. Again, John Carafin, founder and CEO of Lightfield Lab Incorporated. It's awesome having you on the show. Have a great NAB and welcome uh, to, well, we welcome your company. It's, it's awesome to have you. Well, thank you. All right, you we'll so be back on NAB Show Live in just a few minutes. Tammy Dobruns from Master Control at WPLG TV in South Florida. I've been here for 33 years and you are watching the NAB show live. Hi everyone, I'm meteorologist Craig Adams from CBS 6 WRGB TV in Albany, New York, the world's very first television station. You're watching NAB show live. <laughs> This is NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast B. Hello and welcome to the 2017 NAB Show, broadcasting live from Las Vegas. I'm trying to get my voice uh, going here. Sounds We've got very sexy, Ryan. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, uh, that's how I roll. So, all right. I'm Ryan Salazar. We have Brian Seth Hurst and the amazing Jeanette DePay. How are you guys doing? Hi, We're doing great. great. We're excited about the show, getting started, and it's great to be back. It is great it to is. be back, and it, it's it's actually it's very exciting to go and walk the floor and watch old friends come back, but every yes. once in a while you see a pocket of somebody new and there's so much activity in the AR or VR pavilion now and you can feel over there, you can feel the industry start to mature. Yes. And so it's great. You can always tell what's going on when they're, but Jeanette and I have been doing this for God's yeah. years. So, I mean, we, we've walked the floor a lot together when things are being constructed and it's just actually, it's great to do that and you can kind of feel what's going to happen this year and it, it's good. I think that we're, you know, there are years where there's it's it's a little leap and then there are years where there are quantum leap and now we're at 8k and we're vr cameras that are actually shooting at 12k oh, it's and, amazing and a thousand frames per second and you're going wow this is this could be a quantum leap <laughs> uh, yeah i'm a total kid in a candy store here and there's so much technology that i don't understand but you you obviously you have Jeanette to, can explain yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah so Jeanette is the knower of all information no, so, no 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 don't set me up for that <laughs> oh my goodness right. i can't well uh, so well so talk about what you're doing at the show so I am trend casting at the show. I'm here uh, also with StoryTech, and we are looking at the trends on the show floor, and we're doing corporate briefings, and we're also going to be out on the floor uh, looking at new technology and, and figuring out what's real and what is PR puffery. Right. Because I love technology, but I am also a skeptic. So I'm, I lived in Missouri for a while, which is the show me state. So <laughs> exactly. I, I want to see it work. <laughs> All right. So the, so the ad pavilion, I guess it involves like uh, programmatic type stuff, analytics. Yes. Uh, it's, the, it's all about big data because right. it's really not about ratings anymore. It's about what data can you get on that consumer? How can you target the marketing as well as the programming specifically for that person and how can you follow them everywhere so if they're watching tv and they're like oh it's a commercial and they look on their cell phone you want to hit them on the cell phone with the same commercial you cannot escape exactly that's what big data is all about all right so i'm like sandwiched in between two great people here because <laughs> brian is involved with nab show as well so let's talk about what right, you're doing so storytech immersive is actually a sister company to storytech uh -huh. and storytech immersive is all about about AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. What Storytech Immersive is doing at the show, aside from what we're doing at NAB Show Live, which is all the panels that have to do with AR and VR, mm -hmm. is a complete program in the North Hall called the in the AR VR Pavilion on the VR stage. Did I get all that right now? <laughs> on the VR stage. Uh, this is called the AR VR Content Sessions. Okay. And the difference between that program and a lot of other things is these are the people that are actually involved day to day, hands rolled up, sleeves rolled up, hands deep in, in actually making VR because there's a lot of hype about VR. There's a lot of people talking about there's VR. There's plenty of people making noise about VR. Yes, that's right. There's uh, way more of those than that's people That's right. We're not talking VR. immersive audio <laughs> noise. We're well, what's interesting though is AR VR, it's stuck. Like, I mean, well, so last year it started really getting chatted about uh -huh, a lot at the show. Uh -huh. 
And you know, everybody wonders, is it gonna, is it gonna throw, go off the wayside the next show around? And it's not the case, it doesn't appear to be that way. It's, it's, it's no, really because becoming it's mainstream. So many verticals. It's not just entertainment, it's medicine, it's education, it's architecture, it's engineering, it's even uh, therapy, medical therapy. They're for, for quadriplegics and people suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Well, and I, mean, I think too with AR, which is, is likely to surpass VR eventually, this is going to be the new interface, the new human interface with data and technology. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to use gestures and we're going to be able to see our data in front of us in a new way. And I think when you think of it in those terms, you see how big this really can be, like super big. Like awesome. Godzilla big. <laughs> so uh, my favorite part of, of NAB show, because I come from the post you know, the post-world, post-production world, really. So the, is, is post-production world and South Hall. I love South Hall because it's, it's, it's all about, about post. There's a lot of uh, storage solutions, workflow, media asset management, um, uh, software. There's Adobe and Maxon and, yep. and all those guys. Yep. Um, that's, that's, where, that's where, where, where my life is, is it over there. But I'm, I want to learn a lot about AR and VR. Well, you know, the thing is, is that post-production in VR yeah. is like you're getting all these new plugins. Um, it used to be that we had to make stuff up. It used to be that we literally had to hack solutions together, and to some extent, we still do. But now you have you have Metal as a plugin for Adobe Premiere, and sure. you have um, 360 Rise now coming out with a whole 360 editing solution. Actually, Michael will be on the wow. show and talk a little bit about oh, that's that. Great. So um, it's been an adventure, but now. Being able to post in 360, meaning you can actually be in the headset and post, that's what's coming, and that's much easier for filmmakers. That's amazing. So, so oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and when you have like information overload, like you cannot deal with any more technical data, then you can just go to the aerial pavilion and, and fly a drone around. <laughs> that's always like a little relaxing. They have a net there, so you can't break anything or have to, you know, whip out your credit card. So that's good. But it's really fun to just fly these things around. and. You know, drones have really come a long way now. They're, uh, they have AI integrated into them. And crash protection. Crash protection. Wow. Crash avoidance. But you can also like set your flight path. In fact, tonight, you can take a, a session where you can learn to drive your drone at night. <laughs> I was just like, well, that sounds cool. <laughs> it's like awesome. four o'clock when you're actually awake and you could be out there, you know, with well, a beer know, driving a drone. I was with Andrew Hancock and he has a drone and he's very, very good at, at drone. Yeah, so sure we is. were on this beach and the drone is gone. It's up in the clouds and it's photographing the sun up in the clouds. Like when you, wow. when you wait in a plane, right? Uh -huh. And I'm like, I'm... I didn't pay for it, so it doesn't matter to me where it goes, <laughs> but I'm like, where is this thing going and how do you know where it is? And right. he's like, no, it always comes back to you. It's like, it's like a boomerang. It's like a, a carrier pigeon. And, and but they have electronic. following capabilities now too, so you can set up sort of the magic sensor in your car and you can drive down the street and the drone will just follow you like up to 35 miles an hour. Okay, this which is getting in, scary. I which in exactly. Los Angeles is as fast as you ever get, <laughs> by the way, but yeah. Well, so another thing that I love about NAB show is the people that you meet, you know. Um, I've met so many people here. It's like a family reunion, including you guys. You know, every time we come here, everybody gets back together. Everybody's from all over the world. Uh, and, and one guy that, that I ran into this morning uh, is Philip Grossman. We know each other probably for about five years yeah. now. How you doing, Phil? I'm doing great. So Philip Grossman uh, produced uh, a documentary on, um, on Chernobyl. And I, I, I just... I think it's amazing. You've got the most man hours at the Chernobyl site, so you're, that's why you're growing. You're glowing green yeah, when yeah. you're in a dark room, right? Yep. Over a hundred days there. Now. <laughs> exactly. So, so wow. still has all his teeth. I thought. Yeah. You know. yeah. no. So, so go ahead and talk about it. So, it, it really started as a, a you know uh, my around my 40th birthday. So my wife uh, says it was my midlife crisis. I, I decided to leave corporate America, and I was a photographer and sort of budding cinematographer, and decided I was going to go do something. And my wife said focus on your photography. So I you know, started meeting with gallery owners and they said, your work is great, but you don't have a cohesive story. And of course, my first thought was, what the heck is a cohesive story? Um, so I started, you know, I put my engineering hat on, which is my background, and started looking at other photographers and how they became well known. And one of them was, you know, shoot something that nobody has or be the first one to do it. So. Chernobyl just sort of coming, kept coming up. It was the 40, or excuse me, it was the uh, 25th anniversary. I grew up near Three Mile Island. My family's from the Ukraine. Last stop before coming to America. So all those things sort of came together. So 
I managed to figure out how to get there in 2011. And I uh, thought it was a one time, once in a lifetime opportunity and it just, I've gone back and back and started thinking about doing a documentary and you know it's taken a long time but uh, I, I'm happy to announce that I have an agreement with the, to work with the Science Channel and have a uh, program this summer with them. But not only are you going to have the program but you're hosting the program. Uh, yeah, I'm hosting the program. I never <laughs> thought you know That's 2011 killer. when I went there that I'd be the host. <laughs> Uh, but evidently now I'm going to be the host, and I'm talking about drones, so I have the, the distinction of being the first person ever to fly a drone in the Chernobyl region in 2000 and 2011, 2012. And that's before you had the GPS where it came back to you. It was, you hope it came back, and it would, I also have the distinction of probably being the first person to crash a drone in <laughs> Chernobyl. Oh dear. Wow. So well, I think comparatively speaking, that was a little disaster. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So. Uh, I've seen behind the scenes photos and everything. It's 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 quite amazing, Brian and and and, and Jeanette. It's like just it's it's wild that you've been there so many times. Yeah, and thank you. I'm just Jeanette. curious as to the precautions that you have to take because you know you see some photographs. It's, it looks incredibly eerie. Yeah, and, it is. And it's like a restricted area, right? You have to pass through a bunch of stuff yes. to get into it. So when I first started going, it was it was very difficult to gain access, and it and it took time and energy and effort to deal with the right government officials to gain access. Uh, over the years, and with the twenty or excuse me, the thirtieth anniversary last year, it's sort of become a budding tourism business now in the Ukraine, wow. um, which is is odd. But just bus tours and people going, but because of the the, the amount of time and energy that I've spent in, in building these relationships, I've actually been able to get inside of control room number four oh when the accident gosh. happened. Did uh, you have to wear any protective clothing? And yeah, so you wear you wear a, a, a heavy cotton wool suit and respirator and a dosimeter and everything is, is sort of measured. But the, the funny thing is, in the village of Chernobyl, which is about eight miles from the reactor, the radiation levels are about the same as they are here. So that's where the tour. Wow. I'm sorry about that. That's yeah. where the tourism is in the village. Well, they go to the village. That's where you stay because it's still within the zone. It's it, one of the interesting facts is that what they call the zone of exclusion or zone of alienation. Most people don't realize it's the size of the state of Rhode Island. Wow. No one officially lives there. Although there, are, there were at one time were several hundred. It's now down to a handful of, of resettlers that still live there. I've met them and spoken with them and interviewed them. Um, one of them that you know, Grandpa Sava and his wife Elena. He just passed away at age 84. Four.